I grew up primarily aspiring to be a straight ahead acoustic jazz piano player. That was what I wanted to be. And then through high school, somewhere between you know, native tongues hip hop and early new jack swing, I was like, wow, drum machines, synths, club music, rap, dance, all this stuff. And it kind of got me into that headspace. And then a little later, Acid House happened first, actually. When Acid House happened, I was like, nah, I can't, I can't deal with this. There's no, it's not soulful, there's no groove to it. And then Jungle happened. Jungle turned me inside out. I was hearing music that, I think for everyone, it was music we couldn't even imagine. It was fast, it was slow, it was aggressive, it was gentle, it was all these things mixed together. That kind of fed a huge attraction to, for, for the UK for me to go to London. So I got there in, in uh, 1998 and I didn't really know what was going to happen, but I connected with various people and started doing keyboard sessions. I think my first one was for, first session was for Dave Angel, who's a techno producer in the UK. Second one was for Goldie for Metalheads, so it's a drum and bass thing. Third one was with uh, Phil Asher, who's a soulful house producer. So it's like within a week, I kind of jumped three genres and I had this induction into, into the, the English scene. But what really messed me up was maybe a month later or so, I met this whole crew that, I, I, it became called Broken Beat, the music they were making. It was the sound of West London. It was a, it, well it is, it's a, it's a fusion of, of house, soca, afro beat, dance hall, break beat, jungle, jazz, funk. It, it literally is everything mashed into one. But it wasn't like they were taking a sample of one genre and matching it with a sample of another genre. They were taking all these very disparate elements and, and creating a whole new form. So for me, that was inspiring. I mean, I kind of fell into this community of guys who were making music that I didn't, I didn't even dare imagine existed. It was literally beyond my wildest dreams. And then I got to be part of this community and be very hands-on, you know, making, collaborating and that kind of thing. As funny as, as that music grew, we started to realize that it had an American audience. Like we didn't, we didn't know until we heard about it, but the whole Philly crew, you know, Poiser, Questlove, everyone was checking out what we were doing. Duplay, King Brit, you know, Detroit crew were checking us out. The New York crew were checking us out. By the time I go to New York and I'm doing stuff with DJ Spinner, Wajid for his Platinum Pipe Pipers record, Joe Clausell, people like that, they all knew what we were doing in the UK. And in London, we're thinking, we're just making some weird left field shit that no one knows about, but we like it. <laughs> so it was nice to kind of realize that, that it resonated kind of globally. So for me, it was, I feel very fortunate to have been in London at that time. And there's something about the culture there, which is, it kind of, I feel like it invites creative fusion. I think it's to do with like the multiculturalness. You know, you got first generation West Indies people, you got first generation Africans, you've got the European crew, you got, but it's all quite, at least how I saw it, it was quite kind of melting pot melded. And that really created a very a vibrant you know, music scene. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge you know, Native Tongues fan, you know, Tribe, Jungle Brothers, a whole lot. For me, I was growing up in New Zealand at that time. So we're on the whole other end of the world. Every, every Friday after school, I'm straight to the record shop, seeing what had come in. It was all that music, as far as, as, far as hip hop con was concerned, that really resonated with me. And in hindsight now, a lot of it had to do with the production. The way the, the beats would swing, the way the, the samples were so musical. Um, and you know, Tip had a huge part to do with, with that aspect of it, definitely. You know what's funny? I, I didn't appreciate Fife until much later. Because at the time, it was, all, it, was, it was all about tip for me. I was like, yeah, can everyone else finish? Because I want to get the tip first, or whatever it might be. But then as time went on, I just listened. He came, he came with his own lyrical concept and, and flow. And I think it was important that, he, that, that Fife came through in that configuration. If he'd come through as a solo rapper, I'm not sure he would have been as noticed. But the way he was able to be a foil off tip and this kind of, kind of, the, the rapport they'd have sonically and lyrically was it was very cool i think especially with his passing like a lot of greats when they pass and we kind of go back through their catalog and really kind of hear it with with fresh ears in a way and i did the same thing it was it was really cool to do that and just be reminded of what a beast he was the first time i met goldie was at a blue note party um there was a, a venue called the blue note in hoxton square and metalheads had 
a weekly party there. So it was one of the first parties I went to when I was in London. And I just remember Goldie with all, all the boys at that time, like Peshe, Pesky, Adam F, Dillinger, Lemon D. A few, just everyone bouncing off the walls like high school kids. And these were like the, you know, the dons of, of jungle and drum and bass, raving like their own little mosh pit in the DJ booth. That was very cool. I ended up doing a, a party with Goldie in Bristol a few years later. He, he launched his own, his own club night in, in, in Bristol. And that was kind of ballsy. You know, he's not, he's not from Bristol. Bristol has their own drum and bass jungle scene. Doesn't include him. But he's like, no, I'm gonna start something there. So I remember we did that. And at the time he was super anti CDJs. He's like, you can't use CDJs. I forget what I was using, but two of the other boys were using CDs. And I'm like, yo, if you see Goldie coming over, just stick this on. <laughs> like, yeah, they, had, they had a record right there. So he's, he's pretty particular with that kind of thing. But he's an amazing visionary, man. What he, you know, what he brought to, he, he kind of combined his whole thing, his visual thing, his oral thing, fashion, street culture. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think there's many people who've done that. Super inspiring. So, you know, playing an arena, that's the, I've never done arena tours, you know, to see him coming, I, I'm still thinking that's a, some sound guy or whatever, and he's going, blah, 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 and I go, huh? And he just stole on me, pop and clock me like right around here, like he's, he got me good. Nas is like, yo, it's a pleasure to meet you, and Kanye is like, yo, actually, like there was a track that I think that maybe Nas had gotten from No ID or something that actually Kanye had done. So he's like, actually, I'm on this album of yours. I did this track actually as a, as a ghost producer. I'm shook. They didn't find anything. Talking to Chuck, I was like, Chuck, man, did you hear there's a bomb threat in the hotel? He's like, oh, that's nothing, Lord. Remember Flavor in 87, there was a bomb on the stage. Flavor's like, yeah, boy, there was a bomb on it. That was crazy, G. And when he shook my hand, I, I, I just wasn't the same since, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I think, he passed along something in that shake 